G'day guys, how's it going? I hope I am finding you well. I just wanted to share something with you because um, it's a real event that happened in my life. It's not something that I'm lying about. Um, it's not something that I'm making up to be sensational. These are true events of my life. And um, as you know, I'm a guy who uh, who has a faith, a faith in the God of Christianity. And uh, I, but I've read, I've read widely, um, and have a lot of experience. Uh, I'm over fifty-four years old now, and I've been a Christian for I don't know fifteen, twenty years at least. And um, I've developed a um, a very keen sense of discernment between spirits, shall we say, and uh, I've watched. Uh, a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff that's into very dark themes, I have to admit, a lot of stuff that's related to the occult, witchcraft, etc. And uh, I'm not ashamed of that because um, I think a Christian's exploration of the truth should be not, not be narrowly focused. You know, I honestly believe that if you want to really um, be able to... Uh, defend yourself um, or know you know what you're up against in terms of evil unfortunately you have to explore um, teachings about evil so you know to use sort of a Harry Potter analogy you ha at some point you have to become some sort of um, uh, professor of the dark arts the dark arts you see and how can you become a professor of defense against the dark arts if you know nothing about dark arts? So if you know nothing about witchcraft or you know nothing about the occult or you know nothing about, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Masons or the Masonic Order or the Illuminati, um, you know, witchcraft practices and all these sort of things, then how are you ever going to be able to um, defend yourself against them? You know, if you don't know about um, demonic possession or you don't believe in it, um, then how can you ever protect yourself against it? You know, so you have to know this stuff at some level. People say it's dark. You know, well, sure it's dark. But we are in a war against the, um, the forces and the powers um, of evil at high levels in the world when we're not at war against the flesh and the blood of humanity um, as a Christian we're at war against powers and principalities um, of evil so spiritual forces that are unseen um, and these things you know are not are not taught about in mainstream churches unfortunately they're focusing on the uh, follow the yellow brick road goody goody um, candy ass stuff Seriously, they are, um, you know, and they'll say, oh, you're demonizing us, you know, you're, um, you're saying we're the devil and stuff like that. Well, wake up because um, Jesus turned around to his closest apostles and disciples like Peter when Peter said the wrong thing or, or put, you know, um, got on the wrong side of Jesus, Jesus very quickly turned around to him and said, away from me, Satan. You know, you don't have the thoughts of God in mind. And he said that to Peter, who was his closest, one of his closest and strongest and most faithful followers. But he had acknowledged that Peter had suddenly been succumbed by the spirit of the devil, by the spirit of Satan. So if that can happen to Peter, it can happen to you, it can happen to me. So don't judge me and say, oh, you know, um, you're accusing us of being um, like Satan or whatever. Well, we can all be like that at some point in our lives. So don't judge me about that, okay? You hypocrites, you teachers of religiousness and hypocrisy. You know, I've come, I've come across too many um, religious leaders in different churches you know, people in Anglican churches, people in Baptist churches, people in Uniting churches, Catholic churches, they're all the same. They're all just there for the money. 
there for the chicks. You know, if you're going to be honest about it, you know who you are. You're a bunch of hypocrites. And Jesus criticized you quite openly. Quite openly. And pointed you out as hypocrisy. You religious leaders. You hypocrites. You occupy the foulest pits of hell. Good luck with that crap that you're doing. Good luck with um, conning old ladies out of their estate. Good luck with seducing young women within the church community when you're married. Good luck with, you know, using the assets of the church that are given to you because you're a minister to seduce young women within the congregation to marry you. Good luck, you hypocrites, because you are going to be given the biggest, foulest condemnation by God. You who wield some sort of hypocritical power, you who think you can control and manipulate congregations because of that power that's been given to you by money, by a church congregation, not through you, not through your impotence, not through your pathetic need to be exalted on a pedestal so you can preach crap to a congregation that listens to you and expects you to uphold religious teachings and teach them accurately when you're teaching your own crap, your own hypocrisy. But let's not go into that now. Okay? Back to the point of what I was talking about. As a Christian, as a real Christian, you are going to suffer. You are going to be persecuted. You are going to feel direct spiritual attack in this world, in this life. You will be attacked. And mark my words when I say, the scripture says that only few will enter the kingdom of God. Few, F-E-W, few, the few. Like back in the days of the invasion of Britain, when Winston Churchill said it was the few that saved Britain. The few, not the many, not the masses, the few. Okay? So it's the same thing in this situation uh, with Christians. Because what Christianity is teaching us is that um, it's not masses of people that are going to be saved. It's not the majority of people that will be saved. Um, it's the few people, the very few, the minority of people that will be saved, that are faithful. Because they are the ones that are going down the narrow path and are entering through the narrow gate. Not the wide gate and the wide path which most people are on. So if you're following the majority, then you're on the wrong path. So what does that mean? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's common sense. Okay, what is the wide path? What is the path of the world? What are most people doing? That should be obvious to you. What do most people do? Okay, most people follow a pattern of the world. And the pattern of the world is... It's obvious. It's common sense. At some point, normally at fairly young age, people go out and they are driven by their hormones, driven by their sexual urges. They find a partner. They run around madly. When the, horm when the hormones kick in, they run around madly searching for a partner. That's all they do. Do they think about God? you got to be joking. They're thinking with their dick, right? Or their vagina. They're running around madly trying to find a partner. That is the focus of their lives. Is that got anything to do with God? No, it's got nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with God. It's not spiritual at all. It's physical. It's a physical thing. A physical manifestation, a physical urge of sexuality. 
so you're driven to find a sexual partner. And that becomes the focal point of your life. And, well, how do you realise this, finding this ultimate sexual partner? Well, you've got to look good. So you're worried about looking good. You've got to have lots of money. So you're worried about your career. You've got to have lots of power, so you're worried about your status. You see, all of these things come into play. So people are out there chasing what? They're chasing money, power, status, a sexual partner. And all these things are worldly concerns. They've got nothing to do with God and spirituality. That's the way of the world. You've got to chase that. Okay? You've got to find a sexual partner. Um, you've got to be married. You've got to do it young and early. And then you've got to pump out children. Why have you got to pump out children? Well, because to the world, producing physical offspring is their version of of immortality. The world's version of immortality is the perpetuation of physical, genetical carbon copies of themselves. But in fact, if you knew anything about genetics, you'd know that children are not physical, genetical replication of yourselves. They're far removed from that. I'm nothing like my parents. Nothing like them. I'm more like ancestors from generations way before them. So they were fooling themselves to think that I was going to be a biological genetic replication of them, that I was going to be some little clone of them. I'm not a clone of them. And a clone of them would stink, to be honest with you. A clone of them would stink. They want clones of themselves. They don't get clones of themselves. Okay, so you, you as a parent producing your offspring, you're not going to get a clone of yourself. You get somebody that's completely biologically, genetically distinct from you. They're more like somebody that's your ancestor thousands of years ago. They're probably nothing like you. And that's why you don't understand them, because they're unique, original human beings. So get over yourself when it comes to having children. They're not clones. You're not producing your own clones. You're not a clone factory. Okay? So that's a wank. It really is. The idea of that is a wank. You're not a cloner. You're a clowner. More so. Okay? So getting over the idea of biological offspring, you know, as the idea that you're going to produce some sort of biological... Um, eternal existence, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Okay? All your biological distinctiveness will be pissed away in the genetic gene pool of the ages and come to nothing. Okay? Because if you look through the historical records, um, if you want to know people that have made a mark in history, well, they've done something significant. Something significant. They weren't a parent. They weren't known historically because they were a parent. <clears throat> they weren't known historically because they owned a house. They weren't known historically because they had some particular job. These things are very menial in the historical record. <clears throat> Joe Smith was a blacksmith, um, had had a wife and a couple of children. Um you know, was born such a time, died such a time, um, lived till he was 50-something, and then died. So what? He was like billions of other people before him. Um, his life was meaningless to that extent. He never really made a mark. No mark on history at all there. Just a boring pattern. A boring pattern of you have to do this, do this, do that, do that. And then you die. And it becomes meaningless, but it leaves no historical mark whatsoever. Nothing distinctive about that person. No accomplishment at all. Big deal. You did what everybody else did. What everybody expected you to do. You were a bore. Seriously, you're boring. 
if you do that, if you repeat that pattern. Okay, we're at a point now um, where people should realize that that pattern is well and truly outdated. It's absolutely outdated, this idea that you have to get married at a certain age, have children at a certain age, have to own a house at a certain age, um, have to settle into that boring existence of living with a, a wife that you chose when you were young and it was a big mistake or a husband that you chose when you were young and it was a big mistake and by the time you were mature adults you hate each other or you, you realise that you're totally different people because you didn't get each other to start with. You were just thinking with your dick or your vagina and you've now woken up to that fact and you thought this person is nothing like me. What was I thinking back then? And why did I have these children which are nothing like me and are just obnoxious and frustrating? And I'm now in this trap. Oh, I can't perpetuate the life I had when I was a young person, perpetuate the, per the, the, the life of a young person, but now you're perpetuating the life of a moron who's married and didn't really think things through. You just fell into the trap of thinking that what your parents had done was a smart thing. It wasn't a smart thing. It was the dumbest thing to do. It was the common thing and the obvious thing and therefore the dumbest thing to do. So why did you fall into the dumbest thing? Oh, because everybody else did it. But didn't that make you realise that what everybody else did was the dumbest thing? Obviously not. So there we have it. So getting back to what I was talking about, being a true Christian, being under spiritual attack. So here I am, one evening, getting ready for work. Okay, getting ready for work. It's late at night. It's about 20 to... 10, something like that. It's very late. I get up, I go outside, it's very dark, I go into my backyard, straight away the, the dogs next door start barking. I know there's two dogs in the neighbourhood next door to me, in the fence, just across the, the aluminium fence to me. There's one Alsatian or German Shepherd, fairly young German Shepherd. <laughs> Another one is a um, uh, is either a boxer or a bulldog or something like that. So I start walking down this very dark, very na narrow, spooky laneway between my flat, uh, the neighbour's house in front of me, and the neighbour's house to the right of me. There's a narrow passageway with an aluminium fence on one side and an aluminium fence on the other. Um, my property on one side, you know, the building that I'm living in, and then the building at the front, which is my neighbour's at the front. Um, and I'm walking down this narrow passageway, and it's very dark, it's quite late at night, and then, naturally, the two neighbours' dogs start up. Because, for some ridiculous reason, the neighbour at the front has put the dog's kennel, the dog's kennel, right where my front gate is, to get out of that narrow passageway. There's a dog's kennel right beside that. And that's where the dog's kennel is, like it's home. Ridiculous, okay? No common sense in that because they're going to be there all the time. That's where their home is. And every time I walk past there coming in or every time I walk past going out, the dog's going to feel like I'm invading on its property and it's going to bark at me. It's like the, the neighbours are designing it so that the dog will bark at me. What? Why? Because I'm a Christian, okay? Because they're trying to persecute me. That's the unwritten subtext of this situation. So anyhow, late at night, I'm going past, it's very dark, and um, <clears throat> these dogs start barking, the two of them start barking very loudly, and they start banging against the aluminium fence because the, there's a very narrow gap, there's only a few feet gap which I can walk in, and the aluminium fence is right beside me, and these large dogs are jumping against the fence, banging at it. It's quite brutal because they're loud and barking vicious, savagely like wild animals, banging and sh and barking at me, 
through the fence. And um, it was very dark. I only had a flashlight on me and I was flashing it around. But at that point, at some point, as I got very near the front gate, um, I could feel and sense uh, a spirit, a spiritual attack, which came over the fence. It was almost like the dog or the spirit of a dog or a dog spirit came up over the fence in the darkness. It was through the blackness that it came up and over the fence and seemed to jump onto me, land onto me like a demonic attack. And I very distinctly felt it and heard its thoughts in my mind as it jumped onto me. This spiritual presence from the dog, emanated from the dog, or dogs, came up over the fence, jumped onto me, and in my mind I heard it say, I'm going to rip your face off. I'm going to rip your face off. Like that. And I felt it, and it was like quite startling and frightening. Quite a savage attack. It was quite a savage attack. It startled my heart. And it was terrifying in that brief moment that I'm going to rip your face off. This animalistic, demonic type spirit that, that jumped onto me. And uh, I closed the gate and proceeded out to the front. But I had felt very certainly that I had been attacked by some demonic presence. Something demonic had attacked me. And that it had manifested itself from my neighbor's dogs. Okay? So I did a little bit, little bit of research into it and realized that um, it is possible for demons or demonic spirits to be manifested through animals. Okay, so this can be a part of an occult or witchcraft type practice that demonic spirits can be attached to animals like dogs. So this can be something that was done deliberately by a person, deliberately by a person to attack another person. They attach a demonic spirit, a demon to an animal. So they would attach a demon to your dog or to your neighbor's dog or to an animal or something specifically for the purpose of attacking you as a Christian, as a believer of God, believer of Christ. A demonic attack, but it's kind of um, uh, manifested through an animal, through a physical animal, rather than just completely spiritually manifested. It is manifested through a physical animal. Yeah, so that is what happened to me. Absolutely. And that is one of the most fierce attacks spiritually demonically that i've ever had because i felt i felt like my like something had um something had mauled my arm like an animal had mauled my arm after i walked out of that gate i felt like some sort of animal had mauled my arm with its teeth like like an animal had mauled my arm I felt like my arm had been bitten and mauled by an animal. That's what it felt like. That was the pr the, the the lingering um, sensation of of the spiritual demonic attack, like an animal had mauled my arm, chewed my arm. Plus the psychological effect of, you know, hearing this uh, demonic. Uh, utterance in my mind. It was didn't hear a voice. I just heard barking, but the thought in my mind that was projected by the demonic force was very clearly, "I'm going to rip your face off." I, that was very distinctive. That I, and it was a heart attack kind of presence, because it just, it's like something jumped onto you and you felt it like a heart attack. Like something was on you, some sort of presence was on you spiritually, and it gave you a heart attack, and that's when when I I heard its thoughts or it projected its thoughts at me, and I felt it like it was mauling my arm, 
And that is the worst ever spiritual attack that I've ever had. Uh, and I, th I believe that was as a result of some sort of uh, witchcraft uh, or occult type practices by a person or persons um, unknown to me, but I can suspect who they were. Um, and I believe it's, well, I know who it is because it's people who live in fear. You see, because the thing with witchcraft that I know, witches and Satanists and, and people of the same uh, persuasion, they're driven by fear, okay? They're driven by fear. So you who are into witchcraft, who are into evil and demons and stuff like that, you're living in fear. You're driven by fear, okay? Christians like me, we are not. We don't live in fear. We're not driven by fear. Quite the opposite. We're not given the spirit of fear. We are not given the spirit of fear. In the scripture it says, and most famously, in one of the Psalms, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And we are taught as Christians... Um, to fear the Lord, fear the Lord, fear God, fear God. But the concept of fearing God, um, you know, as it's borne out in, in the Bible, in the scriptures, um, is, is, is not this terrifying fear. It's not this, um, you know, fear that you're going to be molested, malor, um, mauled, accosted, kind of ravaged, savaged, um, you know, not a terrified, it's not a terrified form of fear. It's not terrified fear. The fear of the Lord is more of a, um, a reverence, a respect, an acknowledgement that, that um, our Lord God has power over us, has authority over us, is a power and authority figure like a father figure, you know, because sure we fear our father in a sense because he has power and authority over us to do certain things to a certain extent and let, until we reach a certain age of maturity when we don't fear him anymore. But <clears throat> we do fear our parents to some extent as we are young people because we acknowledge they have that power, that authority over us. And we respect that because we know it's a loving power and authority over us. Or we hope that it is. We hope that it's a loving power and authority over us. And so we respect and revere that power and authority. That um, is the kind of relationship we have and should have with our Heavenly Father. Our Father in Heaven who was manifested in the flesh as Jesus Christ. So if we want to know what our Heavenly Father is like, um, the best person to know is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we know him best and most fully through the Gospel, through the New Testament Scriptures. So I encourage you to read that, to learn that, to know that. Um, to come to know Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Esho, as he's known in the late in the native tongue, um, he is my Lord and Savior. He gives me power. He gives me strength. He gives me the knowledge and the understanding of the universe that I live in, and uh, I live in fear, respect, reverence for him as my Lord and Savior, and I look up. I look forward to the day that he returns because I know on that day my redemption is near and I know that I will enter into a fantastic new life, um, one that makes this one pale into insignificance. Uh, and nothing in this life, um, I'm not going to allow anything in this life to distract me from that goal. I am on the narrow path. I am entering through the narrow gate. 
that leads to heaven and salvation. I'm ditching the wide path that everybody else is on. So what everybody else is doing, what most people are doing, what most people say you should be doing, you know, the norm, the house, the wife, the kids, the family dream, I'm ditching that. You know why? Because there's something greater than that. Something far greater than that. Infinitely greater than that. That waits for me. And I'm on that narrow path. And going through that narrow gate that leads to heaven. Because it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. <coughs> this place sucks, man. It stinks. You know, I'm coughing, I'm gagging. Um, these people disgust me, you know. Um, this world disgusts me. I'm bored with it. I'm over it, you know. These days, the albums that I listened to when I was younger that I thought were great, were good, it just hurts my ears now. Now I realise the music was rubbish, um, the culture was rubbish, um, the whole scene was rubbish. It was a drag. It was really just the devil. The devil blasting in my ears. And um, I'm done with the devil. Done with the devil. He's a bore. He's a drag. He really is. Because he's a loser. He is a loser. The devil's a loser. He makes a big loud noise. But he's like a fart. In the end, he stinks. And he's a king old fart, a very old fart, and he very much stinks. So once you've woken up to him, ditch him big time, man, and move on. Because life is much better than this world. This devil's world stinks. It's like a fart. So God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen.